Hello, I'm Dennis Preeby. I am the uh, revivalist for Amazing Facts. And I've been asked to uh, share a little of my background, my life history. Uh, this is about as close as uh, I'll ever get to doing an autobiography for two reasons. Uh, number one, I'm not a big fan of writing my own biography, so I'll probably never do that. And uh, number two, my life isn't all that exciting, so uh, I have uh, no desire to share all my life history with the world. But I've been asked to uh, go through a, th a few things that have happened in my life for the purpose of helping us understand where we are and why we're here in the Seventh-day Adventist movement of today. Uh, how did we get here? How, what happened during the years that have gone by? And uh, what is significant in that? So I'm just going to start at the very beginning. I'm going to um, uh, go back to uh, my, uh, my uh, beginnings as a Seventh-day Adventist. And I was very fortunate to be able to be born into a Seventh-day Adventist home. Uh, I had outstanding Seventh-day Adventist committed parents that did their very best to, uh, to bring me into uh, a full understanding of what it is to be part of an end-time generation. And uh, so I'm very grateful for that. They sacrificed greatly to, be, uh, to put me through Adventist schools, and uh, so I, I give them so much credit for my life and what it has been. Uh, now, I'm going to pick it up about when uh, I went to Academy. We lived in Sacramento, California, and uh, I went to Lodi Academy for my uh, Academy education, and uh, I had an excellent Bible teacher there. His name was Herbert Greer, and uh, during that period of time, I made a commitment that I wanted to be a minister in some way, and uh, so I went to Pacific Union College to take the uh, theology course to train to be a minister. What I remember most about my experience at Pacific Union College was the excellence of the teachers that I had at that time. Um, they were men, as, as best I can tell by knowing what uh, other schools were like, they were the best teachers that I have come across in the Seventh-day Adventist Church in terms of religious teaching and training for the ministry. Uh, there were men there like Carl Kaufman, who later uh, went on to be the chairman of the religion department at Andrews University. There was Robert Olson, who later went on to be the director of the Ellen White Estate in Washington, D.C. Uh, Leo Van Dolsen, who became a, um, a, uh, an associate editor of Ministry Magazine. And these were the, the individuals that uh, shaped my understanding of Adventist theology. And then there was W.T. Hyde, who didn't go on to be anything in particular except a great Bible teacher. And he was the one that most helped me to understand who I, what, my, uh, what my theology would be as a Seventh-day Adventist. So those were the, uh, the really good... Uh, foundations for my, my beginning and, uh, and my understanding as a Seventh-day Adventist and what I was going to do. Uh, during those years, um, there was, uh, these were, this was in the period of the 1960s, and uh, there, was, there were some things going on, but not nearly the kind of, um, shall we say, agitation that uh, we have experienced in the last years. Uh, it was a pretty calm period. I grew up in a Seventh-day Adventist church in which in-gathering was the big event of the year. And we went out and sang Christmas carols and gathered money for the world missions, and uh, that was, that was uh, my, my boyhood as a Seventh-day Adventist. And then there was always the signs campaign, Signs of the Times, in which everyone was asked to, so, to sponsor a certain number of subscriptions to people who needed to understand the gospel and, and Seventh-day Adventism. And, uh, and, uh, and that, was, that was my beginnings. Of course, there was Pathfinders, which is still around today, and, and the things that uh, normally uh, a Seventh-day Adventist child would, would be part of. So that was my, that was my roots in the Seventh-day Adventist uh, uh, background.
So at Pacific Union College, uh, I b was able to, uh, to learn from some, I think, of the very best minds in Adventism and to understand what, uh, what the issues really were. And so I began to uh, try to formulate my own thinking, my own beliefs, my own thoughts. And, uh, and again, I credit Elder W.T. Hyde for so much of where I am today and what I, uh, what I uh, have believed. And again, not too, many know, not too many people know of him. He's not a famous figure, but uh, so many times it's that way. The ones that are least uh, um, out in the front and, and uh, are, are the stars are sometimes the ones who help the most uh, to, to, to form backgrounds and, and share. So that, again, was, uh, was uh, my experience. I was, um, I was called to be a, a minister, a young minister at that time. Uh, I told the Lord that if I, I'm a Northern California boy, uh, grew up in this area, and I told the Lord privately that uh, if there's any one place that I hoped he wouldn't call me to, it would be Southern California. Guess where my call came from? Southeastern California Conference. And uh, that's where I began my ministry. I, uh, I uh, uh, was an intern for a year at San Diego Broadway. Then uh, what uh, was very uh, apparent to us young guys uh, at that time was once you got beyond your internship, you were sent off to the Far Eastern Division. Of course, that meant for Southeastern California, the desert. And so we were sent out to the desert uh, as our first, past, uh, uh, first pastorates. And I became the pastor of the Brawley Seventh-day Adventist Church, not very far from the Mexican border. And uh, that was for my first year. Then we were asked to go to Indio near Palm Springs. And uh, that's where my son was born. And uh, we, uh, we spent some very good years there. I'm really, really thankful for the lay leaders of churches like that that helped me to know how to relate to people and how to be a pastor. They taught me more than I taught them. And so that was a very productive time. Then I was asked to go to San Diego, back to San Diego, to the Imperial Beach Church where I spent a, a number more, of more years as a pastor, uh, learning again more about practical life than about theology. Um, I had already been to the seminary for uh, two years of, um, of training, and uh, that's where, again, beyond Pacific Union College, the, the theological uh, foundations were laid. Uh, but, uh, but being a pastor and uh, learning how to relate to people was extremely important for my, the rest of my life. So that, at, at that point, we, uh, we were trying to uh, decide what the best thing would be for us to do and be. Uh, I was ordained at the Loma Linda Seventh-day Adventist Church, one of the largest churches, of course, in the denomination. And Matthew was actually, my son was actually born at Loma Linda University Hospital. And so that, uh, again, was the very, very foundation of where we were. It was after that, when I was living, when we were living in, uh, in uh, uh, San Diego, that... Uh, I received an invitation to do something that I had never done before in my life, and that was to teach in the classroom at Pacific Union College. And so that became a part of a decision-making process because I had not trained to be a teacher. I had trained to be a, a pastor. And so this was a brand new experience for, for, uh, for us, a, a new challenge. Uh, would, would I be effective uh, in a classroom experience uh, at a college level? And the reason that I considered this very seriously was that I remembered the quality of the, um, of the teachers at Pacific Union College, uh, the, the education that I had received there, and those teachers were still there. Uh, they, were, uh, they were still a part of that religion department faculty. And so I, uh, I thought to myself, where better could I be mentored and guided except by teachers of that quality? So we made the decision to, uh, to join Pacific Union College and the faculty, the religion department faculty there, and try to, uh, to learn what it was, what, what, how, how to best, best be a teacher 
uh, in the religion department for, for both general students and theology majors. And that became uh, the challenge of that time. The first year was a kind of a tough year to try to put together course schedules and syllabi and, uh, and get all the lectures arranged for the very first time in my life. And I can just say, I, again, I am so grateful for people like Carl Kaufman, who uh, became a, a real mentor to me and guided me and gave me uh, very, very good direction as to how the, to be effective in the classroom. And so we spent the, that first year trying to learn how to be a teacher uh, when I'd never trained to do that before in my life. And that became uh, the challenge of, of that time. Then as, it, as we began to kind of fit into the, um, to the total perspective of a college experience and a college environment, uh, I began to be more and more comfortable with that and felt that this was probably where my real abilities and my, and my calling was. And I began to be extremely happy that the Lord had led us in this direction. So we continued to uh, try to put together the best courses and the best ideas. I taught general students like Life and Teachings of Jesus and Bible Doctrines and Bible Themes. And uh, later on I began to teach uh, the theology majors on, on basic theology of Seventh-day Adventism and how to share that theology and how to make it practical. And so this, this became again part of our lives and part of our experience. So. Um, I think that's probably enough of an overall background as to where I came from. I now want to get into some of the real issues that uh, uh, began to surface around the period of the 1970s and leading into the 1980s, which is where I really want to uh, focus now and, and take a good look at, uh, at what this was. Um, during that time, we had uh, Again, a very, very uh, sound, in my judgment, religion department. Again, I'm going to say I think it's probably the, the best department that I know of uh, at that time with the individuals that were there. there I look back to uh, my time as a student there during the 1960s, the early 1960s, and we... Um, we didn't always have perfect teachers and during my, my student years uh, at Pacific Union College, um, but we had leadership at that time that uh, pretty well knew if things were not the way they should be. We had a few teachers during my student years in the early 1960s that were not, not as clear on Adventism as they should be, and they raised some doubts and they raised some questions in student minds. And those teachers, within a year or two, were gone. They were no longer part of the faculty uh, at Pacific Union College. But when I came back as a teacher in the early, or the, in the middle 1970s, uh, things had changed a bit. Uh, as, I, as I said, I'm so, so proud of the teachers that were there during the 60s and the 70s. But by the mid-70s, a new president had a different philosophy than the one that I went to school under in the early 60s. Uh, his philosophy was that the religion department was much too one-sided. It did not have enough uh, uh, variety. Uh, there were not enough different viewpoints expressed. And since we live in a society in which people like to have different viewpoints and society was, was moving into different ideas, we need to have a diversity of experiences in the religion teaching at Pacific Union College. And so the ones that I had been so um, um, fond of and respected so much, they began to take calls to other places and new teachers were brought into the religion department, younger teachers, uh, charismatic teachers, and they, uh, they began to, um, to shape the department in a different way. And again, something happened that was very significant, and that is the kinds of teachers that might not have lasted in the 1960s were now applauded, promoted, and encouraged 
to uh, be part of that kind of thinking in the 1970s. So within about 15 years, the climate uh, had changed in, in, in that college. And uh, now we were beginning to hear of different things, and some things began to happen that were not as good as I had hoped they would be. So um, I think I'll leave it right there at this point, and uh, then we'll, we'll come back after a little break, and, uh, and we'll talk about what really changed and how that change is affecting us to this day. But there's one more thing that I'll say, and that is when I was um, about 13 years old, something was happening that I didn't even know anything about. At the very top levels of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in about 1955 to 1957, uh, there were discussions about um, what our gospel was really like. And the discussions were between, were between certain evangelical leaders who had come to talk to Seventh-day Adventists about whether or not we were a cult. And so uh, during that period of time, major, major decisions were made. And of course, I was totally unaware of this. I was about 13 years old. So I had no understanding of what was happening during the 1950s. And again, the person that I credit most with uh, making me aware of these things was Elder W.T. Hyde at Pacific Union College. As we sat in his class as theology majors, he would explain to us exactly what happened at uh, uh, in those discussions that were taking place between evangelical leaders and, uh, and Seventh-day Adventists. And he would, he would lay out the individuals that were involved and what each individual believed. And again, I am so grateful for that background. Of course, I know I to uh, when, when I was growing up, I was totally unaware of anything like this. But uh, he was the one who opened my eyes and shared with all of us what was really happening. As again, Walter Martin, and, uh, and uh, Donald Barnhouse came to the leaders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church and challenged the church as to whether or not we were a cult or a mainstream Christian church. And the book that came out in response to that was the book Seventh-day Adventist Answer Questions on Doctrine. And in that book, we began to, to uh, move from some of the positions that we had held previously uh, on things like um, Jesus Christ and how he, what, we, what he was when he came down to this earth. What nature did he have? And we, ha we began to move from our positions on whether or not there would be a, a, pr a people who would live without sin at the end of time. And those became very significant issues as they developed. So that became part of the, the mix that I was exposed to uh, first at Pacific Union College as, uh, as, as, this, as this developed. So now, as we come back, I want to um, uh, move into the area of what happened at Pacific Union College that was representative of what was happening in the Adventist world at large. This is part two of our saga of the Dennis Preby history, which may or may not be of any value to anybody, but here it is. So we're at Pacific Union College. I'm now teaching classes. I am now in a, in a situation that I had never been in before. And um, I'm having to learn how to relate to students who are in classes ba mainly for a grade and, uh, well, a little information along the line, okay, but uh, how, do we, how, how does a teacher uh, inter interrelate with students in a classroom? And once again, just as it was when I was a pastor. Uh, my students were teaching me probably more about how to teach than uh, I was learning in terms of uh, my, my theological background. So again, I'm very grateful for the opportunities that I was given to, uh, to grow and learn and uh, find uh, better ways to, to communicate the messages of Adventism. We were fitting into the classroom experience, and uh, I was having such a great time teaching and uh, having uh, classes on a regular basis that I had pretty well decided that this is where I wanted to spend the rest of my life. Uh, it was a great place. Pacific Union College is a really unique uh, place to live. 
I mean, it is set in such a beautiful environment, and the and the background is is so nice to be in every day. Oh, there's a little rain, sure, but uh, it is such a great uh, place overall. And to raise uh, my son Matthew there, uh, I thought this was this is it. Uh, this is heaven on earth, and we were going to enjoy the rest of our life uh, at Pacific Union College. Uh, and, and we went into that, uh, with, with, I went into it with that mindset. So there we were, and uh, as I said uh, in my last presentation, some things began to change. The new president brought in new teachers into the religion department. Some of the teachers that I had uh, really respected were finding calls elsewhere to, uh, to, uh, to be part of other uh, organizations. And I was beginning to wonder why. Uh, what was making this change at Pacific Union College that uh, I was uh, uh, experiencing? Uh, some of the new teachers were, again, around my age, uh, 30s, early 30s, and, uh, and uh, perhaps uh, that was seen to be best for relating to young people in the college uh, classroom. So uh, this was going uh, fairly well. And then something interesting took place around the years 1976 and 1977. Two gentlemen came over the pond from Australia. One person's name was Irwin Gain, a very soft-spoken uh, gentleman from Australia. Uh, as I came to know him, uh, I began to respect him as probably a scholar's scholar very precise in his understandings and his presentations. He would dig down to the roots of words in the original languages, Greek and Hebrew, and, and find things there that I probably would not have found on my own. So, um, so I began to respect his ideas and his thoughts, and, uh, and he became uh, part of the, uh, the mix there at Pacific Union College. And then a year or so later, Another gentleman came across to uh, Pacific Union College by the name of Desmond Ford, a very charismatic teacher, a very brilliant communicator, and one who knew Seventh-day Adventism very well. And he had been the director of the theology program there at Avondale. So he came to Pacific Union College and uh, began to uh, teach in the classroom. Uh, his his uh, office just happened to be next door to mine in the offices at, uh, of the religion department. However, I really didn't have too much interaction with Desmond Ford. Uh, I was a young kind of rookie teacher uh, in my early 30s, and uh, he, was the, he was the professional. He was the knowledgeable one. He was the scholar. And so mainly, I just kind of uh, listened. I didn't say too much. And uh, so frankly, I didn't have too many conversations with Desmond Ford on any theological topics. Uh, we, I, I just didn't feel myself able to, uh, to talk to him on the same level that he was at. And so what was very interesting during that period is that in the religion department, we decided to have some inter some in-house discussions in which uh, the subject of righteousness by faith came to the forefront that was the issue that Desmond Ford focused on and the issue that he talked about and so Desmond uh, and Irwin Gain became the uh, the main uh, discussion leaders in this understanding the, the primary discussions were about justification by faith and sanctification, how these two issues related to each other, how the gospel would be changed by a different understanding of these things, and, uh, and so this became uh, the, the main points of that discussion. Well, this went on for several months, actually, on a regular basis in which Irwin Gain would present his ideas on justification by faith. Desmond Ford would present his ideas on justification by faith. And I remember the then pastor of the um, Pacific Union College Church was Morris Venden. He sat in on those discussions as well. And one of his comments was, I came away after listening to Irwin Gaines saying, Amen, that's right. 
And then I came away after listening to Desmond Ford, and I said, amen, that's right. And uh, his, his confusion was about the same as my confusion on this subject. Uh, I really didn't know where and uh, I would come down on these issues. It was after these discussions that the religion department uh, was asked to, uh, each member was asked to uh, put down their thoughts after we'd listened to hours and hours of debate. And it really came down to debate uh, because these two pre uh, presenters were totally opposite in their views of how salvation and the gospel worked. And uh, so we were asked to put on our thoughts as to what uh, we believed about uh, this presentation that we have had sat through, had, had sat through for, for several months. I would not put pencil to paper. I would not write anything. I did not have the confidence to know what I was going to, to believe about what the right opinion was. Because once again, these were not just uh, scholarly debates over minutia. This was about how salvation works. This is about whether or not uh, Seventh-day Adventists have a different message or the same message as various evangelical groups around the world. And so these were not just minor issues. What were we going to believe and teach at Pacific Union College? Uh, as again I said, I would not put pencil to paper. I did not have the confidence at that time to know what I should, where I should come down, what I should really believe. And so all I was really doing during these years, 1977 through about 1979, was just listening. I was trying to, uh, to, uh, to figure out what the truth was, and I began to see more and more that it was really significant. These were not minor issues. This was not discussing a certain view of prophecy that could be debated. This is about the heart of what is, uh, how salvation works, and how I as an individual can be right with God, how I can have the knowledge that I am secure in Him. So that's the interesting part of those years uh, through, uh, through the late 1970s at Pacific Union College while I was, was there. Now I'm just going to say this about Desmond Ford. Um, I came to respect him greatly as an individual. Um, I. I never saw him be anything other than Christ-like and natural in his relationships with individual students or faculty members. Uh, he was always a Christian gentleman. Uh, he was never uh, harsh. He was never unchrist-like. I came to respect Desmond Ford as a great health reformer and knowledgeable about the Bible and very capable of, uh, of uh, communicating. Uh, he was also very popular among the uh, people in the community. He taught a regular Sabbath school class, always filled to capacity. Uh, he was a challenging speaker, and, uh, and people were really, really uh, responding well to him. Uh, his focus during that period of time was on the gospel and on Jesus Christ, two of the most important things in all of religion, how we can have a relationship with Christ in a meaningful and, and, assured, and a way that assures us that we are right with God. And he began to, uh, to be well received. He also then was, was uh, going around the country in camp meetings here and there, uh, speaking in most of the major churches uh, and holding uh, uh, his, his presentations. In, in a lot of circles in Seventh-day Adventism. So his name became, began to be well known outside of Australia and outside of Pacific Union College. So he was, uh, he was becoming a well-respected name in the Seventh-day Adventist Church during that period of time. And so I want to spend a little bit of time uh, talking about this man and his impact not only on us at Pacific Union College, but upon the Seventh-day Adventist Church as a whole, because this became a very, very significant, uh, shall we say, stepping stone, a marker from the time of the early 1950s to the middle 1970s, and now coming down to our time today. There was a connection that was being drawn in that period of time that only later did I understand fully 
uh, that I was in the middle of something that was extremely significant for the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I really think that was my, my uh, uh, biggest privilege as a, as a minister and as a teacher, to be able to be in the middle of that period of time that others only knew by hearing about it or having read about it. And I was able to be there in that time. And that may be the most important part of what I want to share with you uh, during these little uh, autobiographical episodes that we're doing because that's the significance and that's the importance of why we are here where we are today. Uh, there, are, there is always cause and effect. Things always move from a beginning point through a process to a concluding point. And we today, in now the 2000 period, are now in the concluding parts of this process that really began in the 1950s. Again, as I say, uh, when I was uh, too young to even understand anything that was going on, and again being very grateful to people like Elder Hyde who laid it out clearly for us so that we would be able to see exactly what was being said and what was being attempted during that 1950s period uh, when, uh, when we were being challenged as to whether we were a Christian church or whether we were a cult. And again, be very brief, the book Questions on Doctrine did shift our beliefs on two major issues, the nature of Jesus Christ and the nature of the atonement. Was the atonement fully completed at the cross? Is there a part of the atonement that continues after the cross? What is the final atonement? Those were big issues at that time. And at the end of the process, of course, in the 1950s, the evangelical leaders were satisfied that we had met their requirements, which means that we had changed some of our teachings on these issues, and they welcomed us as, as members in good and regular standing of the Christian community. And so we had passed the test. We were no longer a cult. And so that, again, is the background of that period of time, which I was not privy to. I only learned about it later. And now we come to the point of uh, the period in which I had the, uh, the, the very fortunate experience of being in the middle of major changes in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Now I'm going to pick that up in the next segment and talk exactly about what Desmond Ford taught and what, he meant, what his significance was to us today and how, how we uh, are, are relating to that even today. We're now at part three of the, well, is it the Preby Saga? I guess it is. And we're talking at the, in this section about um, Desmond Ford and about uh, um, our, what he taught and what he didn't teach. First of all, again, let me say I have no uh, nothing negative to say about the character and the demeanor of Desmond Ford at Pacific Union College. Always a Christian gentleman. If there's anyone who exemplified uh, sanctification and the values of, uh, of a growing Christian experience, it was Desmond Ford. Uh, again, a great health reformer and truly uh, representing uh, Adventism in a positive way. So what did Desmond Ford teach, and how is it significant to us today? Um, as I said, I really well, was not clear on what the, right is, what the right decisions were to be made about what he said about the gospel, about justification, about uh, salvation. Uh, was, was this on track? Should I have, uh, should I, uh, rethink my understanding of how the gospel works. And so once again, I am very grateful to uh, my mentor of, of school years, Elder W.T. Hyde. He was retired then, not teaching uh, in classes any longer, but had the opportunity to spend a little time with him and talk to him about these issues. And he said one thing to me that really stood out and really shaped the rest of my ministry up to this point. And he said, the real issue here is what sin is. I hadn't even thought of that. Uh, that. Because the discussions were not on that at all. The discussions were on the gospel and salvation and righteousness by faith. 
but he said the real issue that we have to consider is sin and he just left it at that and I thought about that for a long period of time and finally I realized that that was the key that was the whole basis for what Desmond Ford was teaching about the gospel and about the mission of the Seventh-day Adventist Church so um, here is what I understand to be the heart and soul of the theology of Desmond Ford. We are born sinners. We are born separated from God. We are born lost. We had nothing to do with it. It was because of the decision of our parents and our parents all the way back to Adam that we are born in what is called a fallen state. And that fallen nature that we inherit means that things are not right in our nature, our background. Um, things are going to be pressing upon us from day to day that we don't even realize, that are hidden to our knowledge because we have inherited a fallen nature. And the essence of a fallen nature is that we want ourselves first. We want to, to have what we want to have. And uh, the gospel, uh, Paul's writings are very clear that this nature, this old man must die. So something about the nature we inherit is very negative. Fallen nature equals sin. That was the bottom line. That was the crucial foundation for everything that Desmond Ford would say. And once again, I want to say one more very positive thing about him. He was a very consistent theologian. He would begin at step one and, and, and build on that all the way through to conclusion. Uh, he would not pick and choose. He would not do smorgasbord theology, taking a little here and a little there and what sounds nice and what might be convenient. He was very consistent in moving from step A to B to C to D. And that I, can say, I, I really respect as well. So, bottom line, we are born lost. We are born condemned. This was a very strong teaching of the evangelical Christian churches, and this now became the foundation for his belief. Once you, you make that bottom line statement that we are born in a fallen, lost condition because of our fallen nature, then the next step in the theology becomes obvious and clear. Jesus Christ, when he is born into this world, he cannot, he cannot take a fallen nature. Because if he took the same nature that we have, and that nature condemns us from the moment of our birth, then he would be condemned at the moment of his birth, and he would need a savior also. So the only way to build upon the foundation of what is called original sin, the technical term for this teaching that we are born condemned and lost, is to also believe that when Jesus Christ comes into this world, he does not take our fallen nature. Instead, he skips 4,000 years of heredity and takes the perfect nature that God gave to Adam and Eve when he created them. And remembering again what that nature means in terms of its difference from our nature. For Adam and Eve, their nature did not have to work at obedience. Their nature found obedience as natural as breathing, as natural as getting up in the morning and going about one's activities with no thought or care for the day. The, the, the perfect nature of Adam and Eve always responded in joyful obedience to God. And so that is the nature, according to Desmond Ford's theology, that Christ took when he came down to this earth. And that's why he doesn't need a savior in that kind of thinking, because he did not have this separation from God, which we all inherit when we are born. So there again, we have the foundation of the theology of Desmond Ford, born sinners, Christ had a different experience because he had a different nature. He did not fight the same battles internally that we fight with our fallen nature. Then, obviously, the next step is moving to justification, which is the step of repentance and what it means to be forgiven. Now, if we are born with a fallen nature, that means that during our entire life, 
this fallen nature will be impacting our decisions, our choices, and our relationship with Christ. So that means that as long as I have a fallen nature, and that is sin, I will be sinning by nature. I may, I may overcome things like my temper. I may overcome the desire to, to uh, smoke or drink, but I still have this fallen nature. And according to this understanding, fallen nature equals sin. Therefore, even while obeying, I am to some degree sinning. Um, Martin Luther put it in a simple way. We are at the same time just, forgiven, and a sinner at the same time because we have this nature within us. And that was Desmond Ford's understanding as well. So he, his understanding was that we continue to sin even when we are in a relationship with Jesus Christ. And therefore, we must be constantly forgiven for constant sin. One mandates the other. And so he believed that we are in a state of, 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 of sinning even while being obedient to some degree in our personal lives. That means that justification is an ongoing experience in our lives. Justification can never be something that makes us righteous. It can only be something that declares us righteous. And that was the big issue in the debates between Desmond Ford and Irwin Gain. Irwin maintained very strongly that justification is to both declare us righteous and make us righteous. While Desmond Ford was just as strong, in saying that justification is to declare us righteous even though we are not totally righteous inside, even though we are still sinning by nature. So justification being declared righteous is the primary focus. And one thing about Desmond Ford that was very common to his, uh, his, his, his expressions, he would say over and over, all the leading scholars say, and of course, all the leading scholars do say that justification is being declared righteous. That is what the majority of scholars in Christianity teach. And so he was absolutely right. He was very fond of that statement. All the leading scholars say. Uh, and, and so again, justification being declared righteous only. That means that since we are never made totally righteous, that means that um, we will always be sinning to some degree until we receive a new nature. And since that new nature will not be given to us until Jesus comes, that means that all of our works and our activities and our choices and everything about us is to some degree tainted by sin as long as we have a fallen nature, which means that we will be sinning to some degree even up until the second coming of Christ. Now we may overcome, and he would say this very strongly, we may overcome in things like our, our attitude and our, our, the, the food we eat and, the, and the, um, the clothes we wear. We may overcome in all of these areas, yet because we have a fallen nature, we are still sinning and we are still not completely restored to the image of God. Therefore, forgiveness must be part of our experience until Jesus comes. And to talk of living without sin before he comes is to make a serious mistake in our theology. So that's what Desmond Ford was teaching during that period of time. Now, we most often think of Desmond Ford as the end product of that teaching. We think of Desmond Ford as rejecting the judgment beginning in 1844. That is what he is most known for. But that's not what he was talking about at Pacific Union College. He was talking about the gospel. He was talking about our relationship to Christ. He was talking about the fact that Jesus Christ had to have a different nature than we have, that, uh, that justification is declared only, and that we will have some sin tainting us until the very moment of the second coming of Jesus Christ because of the fallen nature that is deep within us and is even in our subconscious. 
And so that became the issue that Desmond Ford focused on, and that became the primary understanding that I began to pick up this, his consistency in theology. Now time developed, uh, time went along, and uh, then around 1979, he uh, finally made his, well, shall we say, his, uh, his great proclamation that everyone knows about. He, came, he made a chapel presentation in which he said that, I do not believe that there was any change in the ministry of Jesus Christ in 1844 that he had been involved in this work from the very beginning of his uh, ascension to heaven and that 1844 was a uh, well a tragic mistake that we made in our thinking that Christ was coming in 1844 and the Lord helped us to straighten that out but really no change in the heavenly ministry in the sanctuary took place in 1844 and so that became the primary thing that he is known by here is, I think, the tragic mistake of what happened in our handling of Desmond Ford. From 1979 to 1981, uh, he was relieved of his teaching responsibilities in order that he might write his defense of his theology. And he wrote what was equivalent to a doctoral dissertation on why he believed what he believed and the evidences for it. In 1981, the leaders of the church, the scholars of the church, and Desmond Ford met together at a place in Colorado called Glacier View. And at that time, the uh, leaders of the church uh, appealed to Desmond Ford to change his understanding of 1844, because if he continued in that understanding, he could not continue to be a Seventh-day Adventist minister. That is one of our doctrinal beliefs, a landmark belief, that 1844 did mark a significant change in the high priestly ministry of Jesus Christ. And um, if he continued to teach what he taught, it would be the end of his ministry as, as a Seventh-day Adventist. And so there were many appeals made to Desmond Ford during that uh, conference. However, the great mistake was made, in my judgment. All of what he said about 1844 was based on his understanding of the gospel. Here's how it works. If we are sinners from birth, and if we will continue to sin in some degree after we have been forgiven, after we have formed a relationship with Jesus Christ, then that means that we will be continuing to sin right up until the coming of Jesus Christ, which means we will be sinning after the close of probation, which means that Jesus Christ is, um, is, is not doing what we had been taught he's doing in the heavenly sanctuary to prepare a people to live without sin at the very end of time to uh, come to the place where he can blot out all sin from the record books of heaven and there is no sin left in the hearts and the minds of God's people on this earth. And so that again is the reason that he had to say that there was no effective change in the heavenly ministry of Jesus Christ in 1844. And so while one issue was dealt with in 1981 that because of his teaching on 1844, he could no longer have credentials as a Seventh-day Adventist minister. Uh, the other was not touched at all, and that is his gospel, which forced him to those conclusions. That, I think, is the tragic mistake that was made, which is, hit, which is hurting us today because it was never dealt with. It was ignored, and things that are ignored always come back to bite you. To finish out the story of Desmond Ford, because I don't want to spend any more time on that, um, he went he, after he w was no longer able to teach at Pacific Union College in 1981. He formed his own ministry up in the in Northern California foothills in Auburn, California. Began to do regular radio uh, broadcasts and I think some television broadcasts on health reform. And again, remember he was a great health reformer. And he began to, to do that for those years uh, after, after 1981. Then after that, he uh, went back to Australia. He retired, and uh, he, uh, he continued his life uh, there. 
and began to teach at least part-time in a seminary, a non-Seventh-day Adventist seminary. And uh, it was during those years that he asked for his name to be taken off the books of the Pacific Union College Church as a Seventh-day Adventist member, and that was done. So that is when he was no longer a Seventh-day Adventist in name. He was still keeping the Sabbath, but he was not a, a, a member of the church at that time. The last little thing that I'll share with you on this point is this. In the last year or two, I have come to understand that today he no longer believes that God created the earth in six literal days and rested on the seventh day. He believes that God created the earth through the process of evolution. He's a theistic evolutionist. And that has been a recent development that I have come to understand in just the last couple of years. And so there we have an example of an individual moving from one step to the next step, and the following steps are, in my judgment, very tragic. Again, I am not going to say anything about his relationship to God and his standing in salvation. Only God knows that. But his theology has shifted the direction of the Seventh-day Adventist Church up until our time. Seeds were planted in the 1950s that changed the direction of the church and they were watered during the 1970s and the 1980s by Desmond Ford's bringing them to full flower, giving us the real conclusion of what those early seeds were about and producing a tree in which we are receiving a harvest today. The next time, we're going to discuss things that happened after 1981. We have come to about 1981, 1982. Um, before this time, um, as I was beginning to fit into the classroom more and more uh, uh, comfortably, the college decided that it would be important for me to continue my graduate studies and uh, that I, I needed to work toward a doctoral degree. And so at that, in, in 1979, I uh, chose to go to Andrews University to work on a THD degree, that is a Doctor of Theology degree, and uh, spend uh, a couple of years back there and uh, then write a dissertation and complete the, doctor, the requirements for a doctorate in theology. So with my family, my, my son and my wife, we packed up and we moved back to Andrews University. We got to experience the beautiful winters of Andrews University and trudging through the snow and I even broke my leg on one occasion on a bicycle. So those were kind of interesting years for us at uh, Andrews University uh, in 1979 to 1981. Now I did appreciate the classes that I was able to take and the uh, the added knowledge that I was able to get. I didn't appreciate so much the, uh, the hoops that one had to, get, to, to jump through in order to even get to the classes. We had, I had to have a, a reading knowledge of obviously Greek and Hebrew, but also German and French uh, to pass exams in that before I could even take the first class. And so those were some of the, uh, the not so nice things in my, that I had to go through, but I did appreciate. I did appreciate the time that I was able to spend there and the classes uh, that I was able to take and the teachers at Andrews University. So that was good. But what really happened for me and what really was significant about that was not so much the classes that I was able to take because now again I was beginning to formulate my thinking on these issues of salvation and righteousness by faith. And I had come to some conclusions about Desmond Ford and I saw his, his direction as really a very dangerous direction for the future of Seventh-day Adventism. And I was putting together my thoughts and reflecting on this. I was, it was so good for me to get away from the kind of intense uh, uh, controversy that was building up at Pacific Union College and just separate it from it completely and do some thinking and do some studying. And for the first time in my life, I was exposed to what is known as the 1888 message. In all my experience in Adventism up to that point, 
And again, I've gone through all of my education in Adventist schools from second grade on through graduate school. I had never heard anything about Jones and Wagoner. I had not heard about it, obviously, in academy, and I did not hear anything about it in my college experience as a student. I had heard virtually nothing about it. And uh, all of a sudden, I began to hear of some things that were happening. Now, there were individuals that knew of, the, of this long before I was aware of it once again. During the 1950s, uh, two individuals that uh, were former missionaries in Australia, uh, Wheeland and Short, came back to the United States. And they began reprinting some of the books of Jones and Wagoner and talking about their theology. And, uh, and some meetings were being held about uh, what the 1888 message was all about. I virtually knew none of that up until the period of about 1980. And so all of a sudden, I thought that I needed to understand what was being taught, what was this message that 1888 was really all about, and how it was significant. So I began to dig, and I began to read. And this was the most important part of my experience away from the controversy uh, and just in the, with the ability to sit down and think and read. And I began to see things that I had never really seen clearly before. Number one, their understanding of the gospel was completely different than Desmond Ford's understanding of the gospel on all levels. That sin is not necessarily an inheritance of birth. That it is a matter of decisions that we make when we have understanding of what is true and what is not true. Most importantly, their focus was on Jesus Christ, uplifting Jesus Christ, but uplifting a Christ who came all the way down to our level, not skipping 4,000 years of heredity, for which there is no evidence in Scripture or in the spirit of prophecy, that he did not take a different nature than we have today, but he came in the same nature that we have the nature which is prone to selfishness and is prone to being tempted from within as well as from without, the dangerous nature of fallen humanity. And then their focus on justification was very much different than, uh, than Desmond Ford. Justification is not only a declaring righteous, but a making righteous, in which God not only declares us to be forgiven, but he changes us so we have new values, new understandings of who we are and who God is and what the, what the gospel is all about. Or else God is telling a legal fiction. I'm declaring you righteous when you are really unrighteous. The 1888 message says what God says he has already made to be true. And so that became another part of this message that uh, I had not understood before, uh, that they taught before that time. And then, of course, the conclusion of the message has to be that if God can make us righteous at the moment of justification and produce a sanctifying growth in our experience all the way down through our lifetime, there will come a time, if we live to the end of this earth's history, when all sin will have been removed by the grace and the power of God. And so we will no longer be sinning in thought or word or action which is the only definition of sin that is, that is valid. I began to understand that their gospel was a completely different gospel than the gospel of Desmond Ford. From beginning to end, from root to conclusion, that this was a, is a completely different way of seeing salvation and how God is, is preparing a people for translation at the very end of time. And so Desmond Ford's gospel began to become very clear to me as an aberration, as a false gospel, as a teaching that would destroy the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And I began to be very, very grateful for a message that came in 1888. Now there's one thing that we need to clarify there. It is called the 1888 message. But in that particular year, can we say unfortunately or maybe by God's providence, we don't know. 
no record was taken of the presentations they made at the 1888 conference. There are no verbatim transcripts of that. Now, later general conferences all had verbatim transcripts. They were all done, and we have the record of each one. But in that year, there was no record of what they taught. There were only eyewitness accounts of what they taught. So that means that we do not know everything they said in that particular conference. And some people say, well, that means we don't know what the 1888 message is. I think it may be providential that because that was just the beginning of their teaching on the gospel and on these issues. When they really began to formulate their opinions and state them very clearly was in the early 1890s. And in 1893 and 1895, this message came to full fruition. Uh, they began to, it began to be a very polished mes message. They began to say things as clearly as they had ever said them, and their writings were in harmony with that at that time. So it really should be called the 1890s message, the message which was designed uh, to get God's people ready for translation. Because if we read Ellen White correctly here, we were to be in a period of time at that period to prepare us for translation. There should have been a second coming in the 10 or 12 years following 1888, according to Ellen White. And this was the message which was to prepare people for translation. She said it was the beginning of the loud cry. She said that if, that if we rejected this message, we would reject Jesus Christ, the author of this message. So that began to impress me greatly during this period of time, that this is where God had spoken to us more clearly on the subject of righteousness by faith than at any previous time in Adventist history. And, uh, and I began to dig deeply into this period and this understanding. Just to kind of pull it all together, um, the message of 1888 and the years following is just as much in jeopardy today as it ever was in 1888. Uh, Ellen White wrote so much about the fact that, uh, that uh, if the leaders continue to oppose and ridicule the message and the messengers, their salvation could be at stake in this, issues and this issue, and there needed to be repentance. Well, today, there is just as much opposition in high scholarly circles against the messages of Jones and Wagoner. The issues of sin being a matter of choice, Jesus Christ taking our fallen nature, justification being made righteous as well as declared righteous, and complete victory over all sin before Jesus comes back to this earth. Those issues are just as much opposed today as they ever were in, eight, in the 1890s. So this message is still not accepted by and large in Adventist scholarly circles. And we're going to see as we move on through these uh, presentations how that is impacting us right now, today. The 1888 message, I believe, was the clearest message ever given to the Seventh-day Adventist Church on how to get ready for translation and the second coming of Christ. I think that this is something every one of us needs to get deeply into right now that the messages are there. When I was growing up, the books were not available. But uh, today, we have them all. And there is no reason now for us to be ignorant about the messages of, of that period of time. We can read them for ourselves. There are many presentations, both uh, uh, verbally and in written form, as to what this message was and what its essence was. And we have the tremendous advantage today that was not available to my parents and my grandparents. Uh, they did not have this message. It was buried. It was buried for decades. But now it's available to us because I believe that we are now in another period like 1880s and 1890s. We are now in a period in which I think Jesus is preparing the way for, him, for, for his coming back to this earth in this period of time and we can be that generation. If the, if the message was right for the, at, for the period of the 1890s, it is even more right 
for the period that we live in today. This, I believe, is the heart and soul of who we are as Seventh-day Adventists. So again, I was very grateful for that opportunity that I had never had before, really, in my life to dig into the messages of, 18, of the 1880s. Even those teachers at Pacific Union College that were my mentors and the ones I respected so highly, they did not share anything about the message with us as students in the 1960s. It was a buried message. And so uh, I became very, very grateful for that opportunity to uh, study this message thoroughly and believe it or not, it came into full harmony with what I was understanding as the true gospel based on scripture and the writings of Ellen White. So that was a very, very um, fulfilling period in my life and my ministry. Then I came back to Pacific Union College in the year 1981, and we're going to pick that up next as to what happened during those eventful years from about 1981 to 1985.